Welcome to Endurance News Daily. It is Monday, December 14th, 2020, a Monday night. First off was an article I saw in Track and Field. Many record setters over the years have been described as metronomic, yet if you break down the races into half laps or laps, you get some kind of interesting results. And basically what it is is if you watched the uh, world records this summer and the 5K for the women and the 5K and 10K for the men, they were using this wave late system, which was interesting because in the past, this type of thing was kind of banned, but now it's being definitely used. So G'day had nothing but electronics for company over the last five laps when she broke the 5,000 world record. And it was very visually stunning to see, and I'm pretty glad that they have it. And In fact, this 2020 has been all about people doing record-setting performances because uh, we had a grand slam of records, the 5K, the 10K, the hour run, and the 5,000 hour for the women. And, you know, these records have been around for quite some time. Um, you know, got the uh, 10K record uh, was around since 05, and the two and the 5K record for men was 04, and uh, our record was you know 07, and then of course on the women's side, those for that record have been around since 2008. So, um, kind of everybody's wondering like why is this happening? And without any global championships, maybe they were you know there was nothing else to do, and that might be the case. But then again. You look at the performances that I just mentioned, and they all kind of came after the, you know, during the Olympic Games years or World Championship years. Of course, pretty much if you're an elite athlete, there's always a World Championships or Olympic Games. I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, people really focusing on training. And I think even, you know, recreational runners race way too much. I talk about that all the time. But I think it, even the elite athletes sometimes race too too much you know because it is their job and they want to get a paycheck and so i think this year they spent a lot more time training and focused on um you know specific races and also when you go into a race like we just had the 10k 5k 10ks here in southern california that we had quite a few americans break you know make the olympic standards you know when you focus on just time instead of racing one another good results can come about so of course if you're talking about record-breaking performances the past couple of years, it's definitely the shoes have had a big impact. And the shoes definitely in the half marathon and marathon have had an impact. And now they're actually talking about that the shoes that they're using in on the track are definitely having that type of thing too. But one of the other things that they think possibly is helping out is the wavelength system, which it com- consists of lay- light emitters positioned along the curb of the oval these emitters could be programmed to provide a moving light wave at any pace asked for in fact it was interesting i saw one i think it was in the uh 10k record or one of the record performances they actually had like gabriel gabriel running along with them a little uh you know tupac hologram type of thing going on and so it was interesting you know they they tried this lighting system way back like in the pro league in the 1973 and it was funny i was talking to someone the other day and they were asking me about pacers and stuff, and they were kind of confused. They didn't realize that pacers were kind of allowed in the race. And I was like, yeah, in the 5K, 10K, you know, track events, as long as they're on the same lap, they can pace. Now you can't, you know, slow down and wait for your teammate or a friend to catch you and then pace you. In fact, this causes kind of problems at races like this weekend's Desert Solstice or across the years in that often later in races athletes are running along with each other even though they're not on the same lap and technically that's against the rules but you know it's pretty hard to enforce and i mean that's what i have to end up doing a lot in races is spend time with athletes miles ahead of me and we just keep each other company and as you if you watch desert souls this, this weekend there was a lot of athletes out there that would definitely like to have some company even on the uh uh, track so they basically did not let um it says uh back then there was the war- rule um that banned it. it said the following examples shall be considered assistance and are therefore not allowed pacing in races by persons not participating in the same race by athletes lapped or about to be lapped or by any kind of technical device so as you can see even 1973 which man that was like 50 years ago this wasn't allowed and the rule is still in force But um, I guess they've kind of changed it. It says, for the purpose of this rule, the following shall not be considered assistance and therefore allowed. Electric lights or similar appliances indicating progressive times during the race, including the relevant record. And so, as an old rule, pacing by any kind of technical 
advice means that intact, it appears that the moving lights device is viewed by decision makers. It's mainly a new service for spectators on site and via TV and not assistance to any significance to athletes. And I remember years ago, they brought it out for the swimming and it was awesome because you're watching a swim race and you can see Michael Phelps chasing that yellow line that's going across. And like I've got the NFL Monday night game on right now, you know, and they've got the yellow line there for first down and the lots of other graphics. And it was kind of funny. I hadn't gone to a live football game in years. And then when I started coaching cross country at Bakersfield High, of course, we have great teams. So I would go to football games as well. And I remember it was just weird being at a game and going, you know, hey, where's the first down line? You know, it's just uh, and a lot of other graphics that just make the game much more enjoyable. So swimming has been using it, but obviously the athletes do not see that. It's completely computer generated. Where this, the athletes can definitely see it. And in fact, you, you could definitely see in that 5K with G'day, she was definitely racing the thing. So the article, which will be in the show notes, basically comes to a conclusion. They show lots of stats and a lot of statistics. And it basically says that the lights are definitely helping athletes because, you know, you've got this ability to just have that perfect pace. It says, why? The simple answer is that, that also the very best are only human and keep running at exactly the same speed is more or less impossible without assistance. McKaylee's record race followed a very traditional pattern. A slightly overambitious human pacemaker starts out too fast and realizes that and slows down a little bit too much. Thus, it takes a few laps to settle into the right rhythm. Then at the end of his mission, the last paper, pacemaker tires slightly so that when he steps off the track, the protagonist actually feels the need to speed up. So you're kind of doing this surging type of thing. By running alone, he, after a while, due to increased tiredness combined with monotony, begins to slow down gradually until he arises just a couple of laps left, which rejuvenates him and finishes with a last-minute sprint. And so, you know, looking at all the records. And so the conclusion of this was, so it's really completely a new paradigm we experienced with Chapter Guy ran his 2611 assisted by the previously prohibited moving lights technology. His spread was a mere 0.8, just a sixth of a median for record set for the preceding 55 years. So this is certainly not an understatement to say that the effect of new technology on the new world record performance was profound. Rather, rather it construed what best could be described as a revolution. So it'll be one more thing that we'll be discussing and talking about. And, you know, it first was the shoes. And now it's the wave life technology. And now on to some ultra running news of sorts. Um, they had the lottery for the Hard Rock 2021, of course, because it was canceled this past year. It says rollers of existing entrants, as well as new entrants of today's lottery, will be on their list on their website. Um, Hard Rock has a very limited, I think maybe only 120 athletes can get in. They've got a system where veterans get priority and da 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 da. And so pretty much if you're going to run hard rock, good luck. One, you got to run a really hard race to qualify for the lottery. And then getting in is quite difficult. Of course, very interesting, two Bakersfield athletes who I've coached in the past, both won Triple Crowns, uh, Southern California Triple Crowns, where you put the best performances on San Diego, Angels Crest, and Santa Barbara one summer, uh, Joel and Tyler. And both of them have gotten in. Tyler got in a year or two ago, um, chose not to run for a bunch of different reasons. And then, of course, Joel was in this past summer and didn't run and i hear he's training for it this year so hard rock it looks an amazing race and of course you know everybody uses hard rock as one of their defenses on you know that i don't know what i'm talking about when i talk about 24-hour races and killing and running 24-hour races and they always say well look at him it's the performance at hard rock he was out there for most of the time and like yeah but going up and down those mountains very very difficult but completely different than running around in track for 24 hours and if you watch the desert solstice really good coverage this weekend you could see how that happened time and time again i mean i've been to probably i've been in in i think i counted out about 70 out 70 days of 24 hour races i mean when i'm in a six day race they almost always have a 24 start every day and i've done six six day races three or four 72s half a dozen 48s bunch of 24s and then i've crewed um, Benny 24s too so I've seen lots of them and it's always amazing people go out um, and then blow up and you'll see people going from seven eight minute miles to walking 16s and this weekend you know amazing performances but some of the top people that were in the lead at one point were doing like uh, on a 400 meter track taking 30 40 minutes to walk a lap without stopping and that's just incredibly painful I just couldn't imagine it but I give 
props to them for continuing on and battling and it ended up being a close battle at the, the top and both those athletes kind of got to that point where they were doing those you know 20 30 minute miles and uh nick curry who's the brother of jamil uh ended up winning it congratulations to him you know zach bitter wrote about how he was having issues too so yeah definitely there there's no pacing allowed uh you just can have crew and so after the uh, race you know the the americans uh in the race were not only going up for age group records but they were also going for um trying to make the national team um the women and men did really well last time in the worlds and hopefully worlds will be this year and ryan montgomery and nick curry both hit the minimum of 145 and whitney richmond hit the minimum of 130 past she went past 130 so it'll be interesting to see where they fall back in 2014 my athlete stacy costa ran over 130 miles i used to coach her and went to desert solstice a couple times she she made it like 130 miles and she was six woman on the team all the way until like the last month of qualifying and then she got bumped and ended up being the alternate and the same thing happened to the jester he was six person on the team all the way until the last month and then got bumped and it's kind of crazy they were letting people qualify for a 24-hour race like a month or two before the worlds which just seems pretty crazy. Speaking of record performance, two guys I'm friends with, Jake Jackson and Bob Herb, both got new age group records for the uh, age group records for the 200k. Jackson finished in 18 flat to top Roy Pearing's 40 to 44 age group record of 1805 from 91, and Hearn also took down Pearing's 200 record in the 55 to 60 age group with 2130. Poor Roy, you know he's definitely he's got so many records. In fact, he's still racing strong in his 70s, I think. Uh, amazing he just still runs really really good and of course in the race nick curry and marissa lysak won the race and um curry did 155.41 miles and lysak ran 142.64 and those are both prs for him of course marissa just back in september broke the uh, record in the 48 so she definitely did very very well and it ended up second place male ryan montgomery um, did 154.71, which bumps Rolf Schmidt from the uh, the final place on the men's team. Rolf, Rolf had 145. They are talking about that the window is supposed to be closing like in January, and then the race isn't until the summer, which would be good. But then with the whole um, COVID, they're talking about maybe pushing that window. And, of course, the race doesn't happen. So Zach uh, posted about what was going on with him. And he ended up getting 116 miles. He spent most of the last half of the race definitely walking. And um, he kind of just said that he had a series of issues with his left leg from the calf and hamstring cramps to a lockup of the left hip that made walking the second 12 hours. Um, he said that he felt really fatigued in the first four or five hours. And he thinks he might have overcooked the training for the race. And um, I've talked about it before. He was on Instagram talking about his training. And he definitely is putting in a lot of work. And he is known for... Um, putting in a lot of work on the track and then it was interesting when camille was on the uh telecast and people were asking her and she's like oh no i never run on the track except on race day so i know when i was in with zach in 2015 one of the races and i talk about it in the uh getting zapped by zach um i of course was at the dome in 2014 where he broke the world record in the uh, 100 mile and i was doing the six day and then again i was at that race 12 hour race last year where I got third and he beat me by 52 miles. But we also he set up that uh, record performance race in 2015 and uh, chose to do turnarounds every, at the six hour mark. And he started having leg issues then. And of course, um, that time stopped running, which a lot of people, you know, especially if you're going for performances, you should probably do. Um, but this time he really wanted to have the full experience of the 24 hours. And he definitely had the full experience of being out there for 24 hours. So, I gave him major props for being out there the entire time. It's definitely difficult. I'm sure it was pretty crazy for him. Instead of doing two-minute laps, doing I saw him doing you know four-minute laps at best, which is 16-minute pace, and I bet he was throwing in a lot of five, six-minute laps. So definitely a long day out there. And uh, it was very good coverage, interesting to watch. And um, that's about it for the endurance news today. And as always, stay healthy, be boring, not epic.